repeat of what I discussed at the start of last gen. I am again wrapping up my next gen previews with my final and arguably biggest area of development, software itself and APIs. Now go back and check my series on this, on the run up to these console details covering the hardware, the software, the SSDs, GPUs, CPUs and much more in the links below. Now here I focus on the choice of APIs they will all use, what this actually is, the different methods and some real examples of just how important and impactful they can be. The so first thing is, what is an SDK or a software development kit? Well, first up, to make any game app that runs on any piece of hardware, you need a development kit. The biggest portion, of course, is an IDE. No, 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 not an old school drive connector port, but an integrated development environment, the most famous of which is Visual Studio. Yes, even for PlayStation. Now, this is a single tool to write your source code, debug, profile, test, and deploy to your chosen platform. The beauty of these along with all the horrible issues notwithstanding, is the completeness and relative simplicity of them. Gone are the days of writing code, scripts in Notepad, or at best Notepad++, and then compiling separately with your own compiler and linkers. These are now a one-stop shop with all this contained within your source editor, and you can select your chosen targets and compile down to that, provided you have the relevant software kits from the manufacturers or publishers and compilers, linkers, etc., etc. You can even push straight from your development piece PC to the console itself over the network if you have a dev kit or a cable or a retail Xbox converted to a dev kit. It's far from simple but all much much easier and centralized than it ever used to be. Now I use Visual Studio in my day job over the years and other similar IDEs such as Eclipse and these are all used for all manner of software development not just games. So it's all very simple then, I guess. We just write our code, we compile it, and then we go away and play the game, right? Well, no. You see, you have two focus areas within this specific area to target. The hardware itself, or the plural thereof. And this is where the APIs come into it. And these are specific to the platform and normally generation. But also the element of your engine, whether it's CPU or GPU bound in terms of code, i.e. where it will run, on PC and Xbox, this means you now target a single GDK, not the XDKs before, a game core format which streamlines development by writing for one fixed API and its relevant codecs needed and deploying across them all. Now this is underpinned in using DX12 Ultimate only as this is the communication language to use. DX11 has now been deprecated and is no longer supported in this version and obviously the previous versions which were used before this which is the ERA development kit. Now for a clear distinction, the XDK is the deployment development that goes into your IDE. So that goes into Visual Studio, that's your compiler, your linkers and its samples, its libraries, its things that you're writing that are specific to what you're targeting, in this case PC and Xbox. And then DirectX 12 is the underpinning API with which you use to communicate to the relevant hardware that you're targeting. So that's the difference between the two. So this development environment we're discussing covers the CPU, normally C++, C Sharp, and then the GPU, which is i.e. high-level shader language, with whatever relevant modules they are, function mains, whatever. So all of this is exposed to the scriptures, the efforts are all done through the API. Now largely, this will now be, as I mentioned back in that video, a one-size-fits-all for console and PC as I described back on those earlier videos this year. Now, they will still compile to three executables for Xbox One consoles, Series X, S, and PC. Remember, Xbox One will also be DirectX 12 only now. Everything from this level going forward is DirectX 12, both for PC in this environment and consoles. Now, that said, the consoles will likely have a bespoke or lower level set of options that expose more of the core hardware features such as SFS texture sampling, VRS, ray tracing, SSDs, velocity architecture, everything else. So all of that will be there. Now it is coming to PC later if it supports it, but certain parts will be exclusive to the consoles. But by and large, it's one core that goes across all of them. You deploy it, you have different executables, and it uses that. Now, like I've already mentioned before, a few months back, Xbox has taken a path where they're deciding not to go down the route of typical consoles. They're basically making consoles that are now like PC. So you deploy very similar, you share similar synergies, but the downside is you don't you're no longer as bespoke as you used to be. 
And as I also mentioned back then, similar to last generation, not probably not quite as bad, they're not quite ready with these APIs, all these elements in the XTK, as they probably should be for launch. And we're seeing this with some of the areas not quite being fully implemented just yet. And this is borne out by a lot of the tests we've seen on Xbox so far, Series X, all being around retro games, backwards compatibility rather than modern titles. I'm not saying they're not ready, but they're probably not as ready as Sony are with in terms of using the APIs and configuring these. So they're still playing a little bit of catch up. And again, this is the nature of the beast. You know, if you're not getting your software in place, doesn't matter how good the hardware is, you have to get the software in place. But I'll discuss that a little further in the video. What did you do? Now the PS5 is less known on the new API itself, what it will use, but this will be a bespoke version for the console. So if we take PS4 as an example, this was GNM and there's the lowest level API driver. It was the best. And then on top of this was GNMX, which is a wrapper that mimics DirectX like functionality to ease porting from PC to PS4 because it's easier. Now, like all higher level abstractions, the further you go, then it's not as performant as GNM, but still good enough to deliver the goods on the consoles. Now, many games this gen used it, which trades better use of the hardware for less work, stroke easier port. Now, some games start here and then they transition to GNM over time, which significantly improves performance, but is more intensive in terms of teams and efforts. Low level options are likely also available for first party, but I'm going to skip all this because in all likelihood it's irrelevant for this conversation. Again, they still use separate codes for CPU, GPU, C++. Um, uh, PlayStation doesn't use HSL, it uses PSL, so PlayStation Shared Language, but it's very similar. Um, and right now, the names for the PS5 APIs, it's unknown, but again, it will have updated versions than the current ones, which will also include the options for the new SSDs, the completely embedded I.O. system, the Tempest Audio, Ray Tracing, Haptics, DualSense, and all the primitive shaders will be included in both the low level and high wrapper that will likely mimic DX12 again will almost certainly be a part of that. With that described, the short version is what is an API, and I've covered this in previous versions, but it's effectively, it's the piece of software you talk to to tell the hardware to do something, and it's how it talks back to you on a reply. There are years worth of work for huge teams to craft, document, and support throughout the life of a console or PC. Remember, they, I use these all the time. They're not just in the PC space, not just in the console space. They're everywhere on everything. So I work in business all the time. So I write to APIs in terms of web services, uh, embedded systems, database systems, CRMs, ERPs, everything else. So a lot of these things, such as REST API, that are quite popular now. All of these are standard functionality because you'd spend too much time writing in individual code to talk directly to other things. This is kind of an intermediate, a middleman. Now they will and are always evolving, improving, and they're vital to how much performance you can eke out of hardware. The more tailored they are to the target and the functions, the better the results and the performance. And this is one big advantage of consoles over PC, when it is unique to the platform at least. Now, the low-level assembler days are really gone. A side driver program is also in extreme cases. This is as low as engine graphics developers tend to get, which is why the quality of these and lower level of exposure to the hardware they offer, the better because it gives people choice. The best of APIs are simple, lightweight commands that take little control away and keep the driver cost, the overhead of doing stuff on the CPU and GPU, as low as possible. DirectX 11 to DX12 was the most famous, which targeted the low utilization it had on single CPU core to drive the GPU. And I'll show this in actual real world examples shortly. When Xbox One launched last generation, it was using a version of DX11 with its mono driver. Now, this was one big benefit PS4 started with, as draw calls, for example, took very, very little from the CPU on games. But on Xbox, it could actually swamp an entire Jaguar thread, 100% of it. Now, this was one reason why Microsoft boosted the console's clocks to 1.75 gigahertz over the PS4's 1.6 gigahertz because it needed it more. But as many games I tested back then and since, it doesn't. You don't see that nine percent gap between the two in CPU. In fact, most of the time it's not even noticeable. Sometimes it can be an advantage to Xbox. Sometimes it can be an advantage to PS4. But really. 
The PS4 was well known for being, the PS3 in fact, was well known for being lighter, uh, and a lot of the stuff that came from the PS3 development environment actually was one of the reasons DirectX 12 existed, because it was getting better performance out of lower hardware. And that's, again, because that's what you can do when you focus on that. But APIs are far more than just CPU commands. They handle everything from disk streaming, file management, sound playback, codec views for movies, everything you can think of. Even down to the operating system, Windows itself uses it extensively to talk and cross-talk between operating systems. All the console operating systems use this. So, example is the latest PS5 um, UI that they showed, which literally has loads of commands and processes there that kind of embed and connect to web applications, or certain other elements, even the Xbox dashboard. All of those are API calls, and that's why they're able to do certain things in the game, such as hop straight into those activities, which I mentioned a few months back, that just start starting up where you can go into a game, start the game, and then go straight to a certain section, just like, essentially, the Naughty Dog games with their encounters. It's that same point. All of this, this, this tips where you can just jump, jump straight to a video and embed it in the game and cross over, these are all API calls, and if you expose all that element, it means you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. You just expose those to the developer, they hook into those, and then the operating system can hook into the game, have latch on points where they jump into certain elements, or go outside connect to a web service and stream video back in whilst you're still playing the game that cross functionality is exactly what operating systems are very good at the main kernel handles all those processes and then by having an api that exposes more and more you build on that and add functionality and that's why apis are vital now the engine's vital as well the game engine the program and all that kind of element don't get me wrong you can have a the best api in the world and really bad code and it'll run bad and obviously vice versa, but this isn't about that. So ignore the engine talk. This is just about the APIs, not even the wrapped up black box solution that is the NVIDIA or AMD driver on GPUs, which have a huge amount of impact performance on everything, which is why they're so important for GPU releases and obviously game specific. Now in consoles, these also are important, but the new APIs and drivers all come wrapped up with those system updates and stability updates. Now these obviously can improve performance. They can add new features, resolve bugs, release more CPU threads, even release more more RAM to games and much, much more besides. But at the moment, the most recently ones released earlier this year expose the new console's extra hardware to supported titles within the boost modes. Now, without the updates, all BC titles would run in a compatible mode at best, or maybe even not run at all, showing you how important APIs are. Now, this is why newer titles that are being tested currently on the Xbox Series X are BC titles by and large, and at present, they are still working on these and releasing more week by week. Story is, without them, all these machines would be expensive paperweights, largely. And obviously, this isn't new. Way back to things like Glide from 3DFX, OpenGL, and later DirectX. All of these have been around for a long time in the PC console and software development space. Nothing new here. The question is, what does this all mean for games? And how do they actually differ across these APIs on the same hardware? And how big an impact do they make? Now, without having access to console dev kits and debugging directly, it's always hard to impossible to know how close builds are between consoles. But the latest patch on both is usually the best way to draw this. And this is how I test all my games, to draw them even with the engine and hardware, leaving the API layer as the next significant difference. But you can't be exact. But on PC, we can be exact. We can do exactly this, in fact. We can test identical game code, the hardware, the GPU, the drivers, and simply change the API as the differentiator. Now recall, this is just API conversation, not engine, GPU, peak performance, or ha even how good or bad an API is and the differences between them. It's not a flick of a switch. So just keep that in mind. So first up is a great comparison between Microsoft's DirectX 11 and DirectX 12. So Metro Exodus is a perfect example. It needs DirectX 12 to use ray tracing. Without it, you can't run ray tracing. There's a good example of the impact they make. The other is how it runs the exact same game code and the exact same hardware and how much better 12 is over 11. You can see the examples on screen with the same settings. Now, if we go into the graph and look at these as an example, you can see how much better DirectX 12 is on this particular piece of hardware 
And as mentioned, DirectX 12 is geared towards running on RDNA, RDNA 2, Turing, and Peer. So that's what it's focused on the newer consoles. You can see anywhere between 5 to 6%, both on the 5500 XT and on the 5600 XT. And that runs across the average, the highs, and the lows. But the average overall is 6%. It can be higher, it can be worse. You can see the lows are very close, um, but the highs are also very close. But it's the average, it's the consistency you get from that improvement. And overall, that can, that can peak and trough on certain titles. But Metro is only one game. Let's move on to another game. Let's have a look at what is a big CPU impact and really shows the benefits of DirectX 12, and that's Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Under DirectX 11, it's CPU bound far more often than it is under DirectX 12. It's still GPU bound, but there's certain sections, which we'll get to in the demo here, where there's a dense amount of triangle draw, loads of draw cores, high geometry load, and the draw core impact is massive. It puts loads of impact on the CPU to feed that information to the GPU. Look at the GPU utilization on DirectX 11 here. Exactly the same with GPU. It drops right down 80% or less at certain points because it's, it's limited by a single thread pushing all that through from the CPU. Flip over to DX12, you can see that the GPU is no longer underutilized. It's really ramping up and the performance difference there is massive. You can see it in this particular section. So it's not just the overall average. There's certain points in the game where an API can have a massive advantage, sometimes 100% difference because it's able to utilize the hardware better. And this is specifically why DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 were a stark difference. Not overall, not on every single title, not in all the time, not on every part of a game, but certainly parts like this where you've got loads of dense draws that's where the impact comes and apis have loads of advantages like this sometimes smaller sometimes bigger but collectively they add up and the best way to notice that across a run of gameplay is average but like i say here is an extreme example of what can happen at certain bottleneck points on older apis to newer ones better utilizing the hardware can deliver up to 100 percent better performance 30 versus 60 as you saw and the average is very close to that uh, between the highs and lows the average overall is around 15.3 percent so it can be peaks and troughs at certain point in the title but 15 percent is not to be ignored just from changing software alone and this really demonstrates how big a difference apis can make but it's by far and away not the only example we've got so let's move on to the next title Another DirectX 12 and DirectX 11 comparison, this time with Capcom's RE engine. A cracking engine this generation and certainly looking to push forward again next with ray tracing now implemented. It was promised for this, but it never actually came. Here though, running on the RX 5600 XT, we see again a delta between the two APIs, but this time not being CPU bound as it being designed around the consoles, the Jaguar cores. Wouldn't be a very good efficient engine to thread all your engine through single core performance which they're not their strength here the x12 doesn't get an advantage to pull away here instead it's limited by the rendering load again designed around what works best on consoles it means that dx11 wins this battle and actually outperforms dx12 on this particular title the results are identical running on an amd and an nvidia gpu with a test you'll see in a moment on the RTX 2070 and the issues here are largely stem from the fact that DX12 is a sync therefore cache coherency cache misses load and store these are the issues you're seeing that's why your percent your one percent lows and your stutters are more prevalent on DX12 because when you thread work up if you're not managing your cache and your coherency is not in place you get cache misses GPU stores and stores by and large that costs you massively in terms of performance which you can visibly see in this title and the comparison to DX11 and 12. And this means that consoles are in exactly the same boat. DirectX 12, DirectX 11, whatever API you're using to run against the consoles themselves, there's a bigger disparity most of the time because Sony and Microsoft are using vastly different APIs and connections. Therefore, some of these differences could be even bigger just down to the API alone. But overall, the results here show out that Resident Evil 2 works best under DX11 and this is the same on both versions. And then Resident Evil 3 is exactly the same. It's closer, but it's certainly slightly better under DX11 than DX12. The biggest delta here, though, is the fact that it's not CPU bound by and large, no matter what. If it were CPU bound, you would likely see an advantage to DX12 under this process because it just handles multi-threaded and async work much better than DX11 does.
DX12 to DX11 is not the only comparison, it's not the only API, there are others. Vulkan is a massive API and it's, it's really taken over from OpenGL and become the competitor to DirectX 12. And here in Red Dead Redemption 2, one of the grandest, most impressive titles of this generation, it really utilizes CPU and GPU memory and everything else in between, including streaming, AI, animation, physics, everything is pushed hard and you can see the difference between DirectX 12 and Vulkan is significant. And actually, this can scale even bigger when you go to older hardware. So moving back to something as old as NVIDIA's 750 Ti paired with an AMD FX 8350 on the exact same game running DX12 and Vulkan, we can see that Vulkan is better, significantly better in fact, than it is on DX12. And this has a huge difference in performance levels at its highest point, 31% delta between the two on the exact same hardware. And obviously, as you go out of town here and the draw calls the AI and all the amount of CPU load and the utilization of the GPU goes back up under DX12. And then the difference is left to somewhere around 4%, 2%, 4%, it fluctuates between the two. It's not a big difference, there's other areas that are impacting it. So there's a small improvement on the GPU side, but there's a massive improvement again on the CPU side, even more on Vulkan than DX12. And we just saw how much better DX12 is than DX11. And again, this is a bigger delta. Compared to the newer hardware, you're seeing around 21% at its worst point between the two. Here, you're seeing 31%. And that's a significant difference when you're going from something like 20 FPS right down to 15. You can feel it much more. Diminishing returns is a real thing. So Doom 2016 really ushered in the power of Vulkan moving over from OpenGL and as I covered back then even on older hardware the 7870 and the 750 Ti it, it didn't perform as well it performed much better on newer hardware but you can see here that once you get into certain areas certainly lots of draw calls instance and draws so it's not as good on older GPUs and it's hammering the CPU and the GPU you can see the performance tanks and the Vulkan on the 750Ti and the FX8350 where it's close to 50-60 FPS on exactly the same hardware running under OpenGL. So you can see that even though the API can be better, other areas can affect the API and the difference between the two on the same hardware, same engine, same driver code can make a massive difference. And you can see it here visibly, it's one of the worst examples and it's the biggest delta we've seen. A not insignificant 15-16% improvement on the RTX 2070 going to Vulkan, that then leaps up to 176% on the older hardware. Obviously extreme, obviously not a realistic indication of what you would get overall, but this is one of those instances where you would see a huge increase going from one piece of hardware to the next because of a specific situation in the game. And this can happen more often than you realize. What you need to remember is when game developers talk about improvements they're talking about situations like this when they take 200 percent improvement this is exactly what they're on about so you won't see it all the time but in certain situations certain moments it can have a sizable improvement remember a game is doing lots of things at all times so from moment to moment scene to scene level to level the whole demand on the machine can change significantly and APIs can be better or worse in certain areas and it's all about balance, it's all about getting the most. Now here, OpenGL is best for the older hardware but obviously on the newer hardware it's Vulkan all day every day. So again, what does this collectively mean as an overall summary? How important are APIs? Well, Hopefully, as you've just seen throughout this video, quite significantly important, in fact. We're seeing somewhere from around 2 to 4% at its worst case, an improvement all the way up to 176%. But there are points in all of those tests where we can see upwards of 100% improvement from the newer to older API. Now, comparing the two and going through all of them like for like, we can see that Vulkan is around 2% worse than its, than its competitor, DX12 is 4% worse than its competitor, and DX11 is 1% better than its competitor, with OpenGL leaping up because of one game and one particular piece of hardware. So we can see that DX11 is all around that Resident Evil game, you take that out, and then DirectX 12 would be somewhere around 20% better. So the average, the best API to the worst API, is 28% or 29% versus 16.2%. So you can get upwards of 30% improvement on average 
across a selection of titles here between DX11, OpenGL and Vulkan. So this shows you how important APIs are. And this is just the APIs. You've got all the other elements in terms of the SDK that I've discussed, how the compilers work, how they write the API to work for specific hardware. All of those elements make an impact. You can see the benefits here on just PC, on just a few selections of hardware, both NVIDIA and AMD, and obviously a small selection of titles. So the overall average makes it quite clear that APIs are vital to a hardware's piece of performance potential and they can make or break a piece of hardware to get near the levels of its maximum and this is all the information i'm trying to present and encapsulate in one place there's never any one specific thing just like my teraflops are a live video this is all about educating the audience to understand all these elements have an impact as long as budget time team talent all those things as well so hopefully this was a beneficial video it made sense i explained everything in enough detail and it wasn't too in depth so you didn't i didn't lose you i tried to keep it quite high level so there's not a lot of depth in here in terms of technical details but hopefully the summary at the end in terms of the performance shows you that apis and software are just as important as hardware and at times even more so anyway we are tantalizingly close to those next generation consoles they're just around the corner and i cannot wait to dig in and just see how all these things pan out i've got a few things lined up for the early part of that generation and certainly i've got a lot of things lined up for next year so i'm planning to make sure that i improve the channel and improve the quality of work i'm putting together you've seen some of the examples of how i've been ramping up my analysis process and my technical metrics all of those are going to be improved massively once the new generation lands so i hope you all guys and girls look forward to that and of course if you've stayed all the way to this point then please help the channel by subscribing sharing and liking i thank everyone in the house that has already done that i've hit 40,000. let's go on to the next milestone and hopefully improve my reach i'm completely self-funded and independent and everything you guys and girls can do really helps anyway i'll see you all very soon and catch you in next generation and seer will unlock your senses allowing you to leap beyond to asgard the legendary realm of norse myth